Hello and welcome to a new edition of Echo Africa. Water is a key resource. Without clean drinking water, we cannot survive. That's one of the topics coming up on the show. My name is Chris Elams. And hello from me from Uganda. My name is Sandra Twinobdio and I'm pleased to be with you for the next 26 minutes. So do stay with us because we'll have amazing stories just for you. How underwater drones are helping with marine protection in Senegal. Why tourism in Finland is getting more sustainable. And how e-bikes are reducing traffic congestion in Ghana. Starting the show in my neighboring country, Kenya is suffering from the worst drought in over 40 years. Now farmers have reported that their boreholes have dried up, while others have requested the government to provide them with water instead of subsidized fertilizer. Now we do ask, how are farmers coping and what is being done to support them? Let's take a look. To appreciate the scale of the drought in Kenya, you only have to look at Lake Albolosat, which has shrunk like never before. Almost 90% of it has dried up. Climate scientists warn that the situation could get even worse. Most climate models predict uh, that extreme weather events such as drought are likely to become more frequent and more severe. Uh, at least uh, that is mainly owing to, due to the global warming and climate change. These images from June 2019 show the lake a few weeks after the rainy season. An important habitat for animals like the crowned crane and the hippo. The drought is a problem too for people who live in the area. Many farmers fear for their livelihood. The persistent heat wave has seen fields across the country set ablaze. It's actually very, very, very bad. We have not had rains uh, for almost uh, several years. We have had several um, crop failures. Our plants are really not doing well. Uh, so we are really waiting for the rains. Locals are desperate. Extra prayers are offered, asking God to bless Kenya with rain. The president and his wife are among the supplicants. We have prayed and we can see the clouds are formed and we know that the rains are coming. Lake Obolosat's years-long decline is a homemade problem. Local conservation groups say a lot of soil has been carried into the lake following deforestation and construction work. On top of that, people often draw groundwater from the area. Part of the water in this lake comes from the hills behind me. The hills have a lot of underground water. There is no control or procedure that people there should follow to get their water. It's vital that farmers use water in a more sustainable way. That's one of the goals of the Nairobi Water Fund. Gutters and basins mean that water can be collected during the rainy season and then used to irrigate fields. We ensure that all the water which comes from the rooftop or maybe from the runoff are conserved in water pans. That is one of the technologies. Also, we show the farmers how to terrace their rats, especially the ones which are sloppy, and ensure that those terraces are are stabilized with nipier grass, nip, nip grass so that they can be able to capture all the water which erodes the soil into the rivers. The fund is already working with a network of nearly 16,000 farmers. They're harvesting enough water to irrigate almost 2,000 acres of horticultural crops over a three-month period. David Kamau is among the farmers benefiting from the project. The new methods mean he has enough water to irrigate his crops, even in times of drought, like now. 
The Nairobi Water Project provided me with a water pan. And I can irrigate by using gravity to pump the water and use a sprinkler. His farm borders a river, but Kamau uses a water pan, a small reservoir, to irrigate his fields and save valuable water. Climate researchers say that sustainable farming techniques like these can help ease pressure on farmers. Even as we go into a possible uh, failed rainy season, we are not likely to miss out on rainfall, especially in the peak month of April and May for the coastal region. So uh, we advise uh, water conservation measures, including water harvesting um, and, uh, water and sustainable use of water. The threat to the lake will only worsen if human activities don't change. But more sustainable water usage could help prevent it from drying up. We are staying with the topic of water, but heading now to the coast of Senegal. The younger generation has a vested interest in environmental protection. It's obviously in their interest to look after the planet. Not far from Dakar, students are caring about ocean pollution, biodiversity loss, and the associated hardships with the help of high tech. Here is this week's Doing a Bit. Senegal's coast is more than 700 kilometers long. Here, about 600,000 people earn a living from catching fish. But a lot of marine life here is under threat from overfishing. To improve conservation, researchers need to find out more about the fish stocks. A new project at the Dakar American University of Science and Technology aims to help. We come up with a team that would use underwater drones. These are drones that would go underwater, uh, unlike aerial drones. And they were equipped with cameras uh, to be able to record things underneath uh, the water. So we would take videos of fish that were in the, in, in the, in the lagoon, as well as in the sea, as well as the flora, uh, what are the different uh, species that are uh, underground under the water. Students here developed the underwater drones. An innovation that has made many tasks much simpler. Maritime conservationists used to have to catch the creatures first to study them, but the technology performs this job now. And then once we get those data, we would come out and then uh, we would use develop algorithm or software that allows us to classify the different fish that were there without having to touch them or without having to take them out of the water. At the Samon Nature Reserve, students conduct regular tests with the drones. They want to use the data to help protect endangered species in a more targeted way. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. They're small and made of plastic, sachets. These little packets might be handy, but they quickly land in the garbage bin, and they don't rot. In our web special, we chart the journey of such a sachet, from the origins of the raw materials it's made from to its end on the rubbish heap. We find out why the number of sachets is growing and why they're so lucrative for businesses and so disastrous for our planet. Find out more at dw.com slash plastic. In order to live green, we've got to keep our environment clean. Could that be the key to happiness? Well, according to the UN-sponsored World Happiness Report, Finland is the happiest country and it also scores high on rankings for sustainable development. Wow, I'd love to know more about how this all ties together. So let's get inspired with a trip to this Northern European winter wonderland to find out how sustainability can be incorporated into the tourism sector. You need to work with nature, not against it. That's something Artu Pöru learned from a young age here in Finland's far north. 
This lodge, located not far from Rovaniemi, has belonged to his family for over 40 years. It was once their much-loved holiday cottage. Now they rent it out to tourists who are looking for an authentic and sustainable Lapland experience. First of all, we are using uh, sustainable electricity. We can uh, decide what kind of energy we are using in Finland. Now in Ollero, it's coming from the wind. And then all you can see here is recycled. All kind of materials, shampoos, everything has been thinking about sustainability. And all activities what we are offering, there is no motors there. The, our guests can go see animal footprints, snowshoeing, ice fishing, ice swimming. Spectacular natural phenomena like the northern lights at the Arctic Circle, as well as virtually untouched, sparsely populated landscapes, draw visitors from around the world to Lapland. The region's tourism industry registers up to three million overnight stays per year and knows that this hinges on keeping its beautiful environment intact. Here in Finland, the biggest asset for the tourism is really the nature, as well as the, our lifestyle that is very strongly rooted in the pure and business, uh, pristine environment. So the tourism businesses are really interested in sustainability because they want to secure that long-term business for themselves. Some go above and beyond, like tour operator Beyond Arctic. During the high season in winter, they offer excursions to see the northern lights, but in the long days of summer, they plant new trees. Sustainable tourism is growing in importance. Globally, it had a volume of around 180 billion euros in 2019, according to the World Tourism Organization. And researchers expect that to double by 2027. But even if tourist destinations themselves operate sustainably, the question remains how do visitors get there without harming the environment? Tourism can actually have even positive impact to environment. Uh, for example, we have cases that where tourism has managed to protect the environment by, by making it a national park. Uh, for instance. But you're very right about that, that it's the aviation and the transport in general that really like uh, puts it off from the balance. There's still much to be done to make tourism truly sustainable. But with their Eco Lodge, the Pöri family is off to a good start. They're convinced there's no other alternative. Wow, magnificent. I'd love to travel there one day, but it might just be too cold for me. Back to Africa now, where we are heading into the concrete jungle of Accra. Ever-increasing traffic congestion is forcing Ghanaians to ditch their cars and find new modes of transport. And some of their solutions are very inventive indeed. In Ghana's capital, Accra, getting from A to B can be a nightmare. It's normally hot and distances are far. And if you do drive or take public transport, you're stuck in traffic. Rush hour can triple travel times, so Ghanaians are increasingly switching to two wheels. Lawrence Ajay is a pro cyclist and has been building his own e-bikes for years with a twist. What is special about my bike is, first I use a uh, recycled dead laptop batteries. Yeah, then secondly, I buy like quality parts for it, then they're very strong and like the frame is very strong like compared to these Chinese ones. I started uh, working on this bike when I was very young. I think I was like 11 years old. Then I saw people riding uh, these scooters in uh, uh, like music videos. So I wanted to create for myself. And from then, then I was like progressing to make this e-bike. The 26-year-old is self-taught. He watches YouTube tutorials almost every day and tinkers with his e-bike. Lawrence orders the remaining parts through the internet. Meanwhile, dealer Russell Mensa sells e-bikes from China, but those suffer performance issues. The battery that came with it initially weren't that durable. 
Yeah. So when it came, within the shortest possible of time, um, we had a lo- whole lot of complaints from customers. Russell believes Ghanaians are increasingly keen on e-bikes and he sells around eight units a month. But the price is steep, 300 to 1,100 euros for an e-bike. There is a huge demand for the e-bikes in Ghana. The Ghanaians love e-bikes. Ten years ago, nobody knows about e-bikes. Yes. Let me say e-bike just became popular here about three, four years ago. For Lawrence too, it's not just about the joy of riding, but also traveling cheaply and quickly, especially as fuel prices rise. His e-bikes can cover up to 130 kilometers per charge. I bought it because the distance at which I go to work is very far, so I thought I needed a motor. But then as time went on, I told him about my situation and then he said, oh, you can do something about it. Depending on the performance of the battery, a customized Lawrence e-bike costs between 600 and 860 euros. So far, Lawrence has sold seven of his e-bikes, but he's looking to supercharge his e-bike dream. Traffic congestion is a growing problem in cities all over the world. What can we do to tackle it? Okay, we could all try moving around a bit less, but sometimes you have to move. We all have places we need to get to. Well, we can learn a lot from the animal kingdom. Scientists often use animal behavior as a reference when it comes to new developments in medicine or biotechnology. Ant movement, for example, could provide a blueprint for more efficient traffic management. Bad traffic, bad vibes. Ant highways are also super busy, but clearly run a lot more smoothly. In the human world, congestion on the roads is a normal part of life. We even keep track of record-breaking jams. When Hurricane Rita hit the southern United States in September 2005, two and a half million people fled Houston, or tried to. The resulting tailback on Interstate 45, heading inland towards Dallas, reached a length of 160 kilometers for 48 hours. In the run-up to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, the roads in and around Sao Paulo were gridlocked, 340 kilometers of stationary traffic, almost equivalent to the distance from Sao Paulo to Rio. Moscow, November 2012. The notorious Russian winter paralyzed much of the biggest country on the planet. For three days and three nights, snowstorms blocked the highway between St. Petersburg and the capital. But how do traffic jams actually come about? The main reason is that you do not have enough capacity. Um, of course, there are other reasons, um, but the, these reason, reasons are not that, they do not happen that often. Um, some people sometimes make driving mistakes, of course. Um, for instance, they, they do not pay m- enough attention and then they have to brake hard. Roadworks, then accidents and heavy weather conditions. But most of that, 60%, 70%, it depends on the region where you look at, is due to overload on the roads. Too many cars at the same time on the same uh, route um, in the same direction. This is more or less uh, the calculation you can make everywhere, almost over the world. But the ant world runs differently. With ants, the principle is one for all and all for one. That hardly applies to motorists. On the road, everyone's thinking, what's the quickest way of getting to my destination? Individuals focus on themselves and don't care about the others. Drivers have a lot to learn from ants. The drivers on the road are non-cooperative. So they are egoistic, and that is a, a thing which hinders the whole system to be effective. 
So this, we have different, uh, mathematically spoken, um, uh, maxima. That is, if you, you have a, a user optimum and a system optimum. And normally the driver wants to have for himself, himself the best situation. So it is a user optimum, but it's not for the system the best way. So, ants cooperate and have a common goal. Humans on the road do too, in a way. They each want to get from A to B. But the lack of cooperation results in countless people wasting vast amounts of time in traffic jams. How much time precisely? Telemetry experts have the figures. Take, for example, Germany's biggest city. I think TomTom Tom has made um, this kind of um, statistics and they, they have a number that says how much more time have you invest um, in, on your daily commute and for Berlin this number is about 30%. In other cities it's much, much worse. Third spot goes to Bogota. Residents of the Colombian capital spend an average of 230 hours a year going nowhere fast. That's almost 10 full days. The frustration can sometimes boil over. Number two, Bengaluru. In 2019, drivers in the Indian megacity spent an average of 243 hours stuck in traffic. But when it comes to world-beating congestion, look no further than Manila. Researchers worked out that in 2019, road users in the capital of the Philippines lost 257 hours of their lives to the daily commute. Too many self-absorbed drivers with big egos crammed into narrow spaces. Ant highways, by contrast, are always busy but never congested. How do they manage that? Ants communicate via scents. They have glands to produce them. Various pheromones convey information such as danger, food, or this way. Ants, they work for their community. They want to have the system optimum. They want to have a um, um, working or a, a flow which is not stopped by individuals. So we can learn from the ants, but I don't think that one can teach the people to behave like ants. Ants depend on a communal effort and adapt as conditions change. Humans communicate not so much with each other as against each other. And while costing us precious time, that comes at a financial cost as well. I said the inner speed of traffic jam is 10 kilometers per hour. So we have a highway and you say you have a four kilometer jam, two lanes for three hours. And you can drive only 10 instead of 80. Then you can calculate what is the lost time for all the drivers there and you end up with a sum between 50 and 100,000 euro. One jam. Um, I calculated for or Germany, for example, and um, you come up with, uh, say, 60 to 100 billion euro per year. We take the average 80 billion euro we lose just by standing still in jams. So you don't only lose time. So what practical lessons can we learn from ants? In the future, we will have automatic systems where we can copy the behavior of ants. And uh, this is the hope that then at the end, we will have a, a working traffic system which has a much larger capacity as we have today. Insights from ants might soon be translated into better traffic routing and better attitudes. It's ultimately up to us. We need less ego and more consideration for others. It's better to cruise at a moderate speed, for example, than speed and slam on the brakes. Perhaps then we'll be able to save ourselves a lot more time and money and avoid scenes like this. What an inspiring idea. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us here on Eco Africa. And do be sure to come back again next week. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Chris Elems. 
looking forward to seeing you again next time Chris and that goes for you our viewers as well in the meantime as you know you can always check in with us on all our social media platforms we're always waiting to hear from you so it is a goodbye I am Sandra Twinovideo take care mm -hmm.